Dear friends and colleagues, and ladies and gentlemen, uh, my name is Jouni Marjamäki, and I'm a keeper of uh, Lohisaari Manor in Finland. And uh, I'm an art historian, not a gardener. <laughs> and uh, uh, I'm responsible of, um, at this site uh, of uh, the staff and uh, how it's kept open for public. And today my presentation is going to examine the role of uh, the museum in the preservation and maintenance of the natural and historical heritage around the Lohisari Manor that dates from 1655. I'm first going to talk shortly about the history of Lohisari Manor and its highlights, as I want to create the background for our natural environment there. And uh, then I'm going to present uh, Manor's surroundings, park and gardens, that can, by, can be divided in three different uh, parts. Firstly, English-style landscape park. Secondly, the apple orchard. And uh, thirdly, the 18th century herbal garden or kitchen garden or utility garden. We call it with different names. But we also call the uh, herbal garden the Perkalms Museum Garden. I will explain that later. And after that, I'm going to tell about the challenges with these gardens and the benefits and results we have been seeing when taking care of these surroundings. So where is Lohisari situated? So there's a map, you recognize the countries, and Lohisari is marked with the red dot. The village is called Askainen and it's situated about 30 kilometers north, west from Turku by the Baltic Sea. And it's in a very rural area, in the middle of fields, with no proper public uh, connection or transport connection. The, the reason why Loisar is there is the sea, or the, by the sea, is that Stockholm was the main connection point of, of, of that time. And uh, Loisar in Askainen was clearly connected spiritually to Stockholm for century, centuries, most important way of traveling to Lohisari was by the sea. As you can see, the Baltic Sea connects us. So uh, this is one of the things that many people forget nowadays when they come to Lohisari. They drive there by car and they understand the connection that the sea used to make. The manor used to be right by the sea, uh, still in the 17th century, but, but because of the post-glacial rebound, the shoreline is much further away nowadays. As you can see from, from this photo, the shoreline is quite far away. And here you can see the main building with two annex buildings. In Finnish, we say Lohisaaren Kartanolinna. In English, Lohisaari Manor. And in Swedish, Vilnes Slot. And the Finnish word Saari means an island, but it's not an island anymore. It used to be probably more like a peninsula around the 15th and 16th century. That's why the island name. There are two uh, significant noble families that are connected to the long history of Lohisari. The Flemings, who owned Lohisari from uh, 1450, about 1450 until 1791. And then the Mannerheims, who owned Lohisari from 1795 until 1903. And the main building of Lohisari was built by a Swedish governor general of Finland, Hermann Claesson Fleming, in 1655. And there's nothing certain of, uh, about the Lohisaris buildings before the completion of the present main building in 1655. But we know that the southeastern annex, the left annex here, is older than the other annex. And it, its cellars may, ba may date back to the 16th century. So this means that the previous main building of Lohisari might have been on that site. But um, Lohisari, a group of buildings, is one of the very few examples in Finland of the palatial architecture that partly gets its ideas from the German-Dutch late Renaissance. Uh, the manor was built symmetrically, typically for the Baroque period, around a symmetrical cour d'honneur as, as the main court. But the uh, buildings have been preserved in the main, in their original form, but of course, uh, during the years, they have been repaired and uh, altered. 
and uh, major repairs were carried out in the 18th century. But then there was a restoration project in 1962-1967, and uh, the exterior of the, of the house was restored as far as possible to what it had been in the 17th century. Uh, the main interior features of the first and third st stories of the main building were restored to their 17th century form. Uh, and the second story, which had always been the actual residential floor, floor uh, it, nowadays it looks like after the repairs of the 18th and 19th century. And all the museum objects you see here are from the collections of the National Museum. There are very few original objects left, uh, as Lohisari has had many owners during its history, and many changes have happened during the years. So here is a gr great bed chamber of the manor on the third floor. And on the third floor, there's also a festive hall in the 17th century style and furnished to match. Uh, festive hall's ceiling has a unique painting work from the 17th century. Uh, it's one of the finest 17th century painting works in Sweden and Finland, and it's exceptionally diverse and artistically high quality. And it has never been painted over or repainted, so it's a very precious object to us. And the artist was a German-born Joachim Lang, who lived and worked in uh, Stockholm. And he was probably working with the ceiling of Lohisari around the year 1660. And uh, overall, one can say that architecturally and artistically, Lohisari represents the best available quality of the 17th century Sweden and uh, Stockholm. Uh, on the ceiling, there is one landscape that represents Lohisari Manor itself, itself, and it's considered to be one of the oldest or oldest uh, landscape painting uh, in Finland of some particular place. And as you can see, the roof structure and chimneys look a little bit different what the house looks like nowadays. It is possible that there was a, that kind of a, some kind of a small tower on, on top of the roof structure. So nowadays, Lohisari, uh, with its surroundings, is a unique, immersive historical experience in Finland, especially the Baroque interiors, like the Festive Hall. They are authentic interiors that museums, museum visitors cannot experience, experience elsewhere as a, in a public place. And here is one of the chambers of the third, third floor. And uh, here is a photo of the so-called castle hall on the ground floor. And this hall has also kept its uh, original stone floor from the 17th century. So let's talk about the typical visitors and our target groups. Um, so Lohisari Manor with its rich interiors and objects, it um, invites those that are interested in history of architecture and the way of living of uh, high nobility. And uh, the Herbal Garden, Apple Orchard and the English Park attract garden enthusiasts. Um, many people return to Lohisari every year, we know that. And we have intentionally tried to build kind of an atmosphere of uh, Jane Austen's novels, a bubble where visitors get an immersive and nostalgic feeling of a place. And our guides have uh, 19th century costumes, as you can see in those uh, two photos. Foreign tourists, we get only 3% in Lohisari. Uh, but a significant portion, proportion of visitors are people from the uh, region of uh, southwestern Finland uh, or domestic tourists uh, visiting Turku or then an old wooden town of Nantali nearby. And in the summer, there are visitors coming by cars, camping cars, motorbikes, motorbikes and bicycles, as Lohisari is uh, located along one of the main roads that leads to the vast archipelago. 
We get about 19,000 visitors yearly. Our goal for next year is to maintain this level or get it up to 20,000 visitors. Uh, we do have to remember that Lohisaari is a very delicate place. It can never be a place for uh, mass tourism. And uh, the infrastructure is not meant for a huge number of visitors. And uh, it is also situated in a, in a very rural area out in the countryside without public transport. But we are only open during the, the summer months uh, from 15th of May until 31st of August. And in September, we are open for groups. And then in October, we have very popular haunted mansion tours. Um, there's a one photo from that tour. And last year, we had about 2,500 spectators for the haunted mansion tours. So it's about more than 10% of the yearly visitors who came to see the, the, the manor in, in dark time. And here is an aerial photo. The land area uh, around the manor is 7.5 hectares. So it's a very small place compared to Rundale. And uh, the 7.5 hectares area on the photo is about the area that you can see the, the green wooded area from the right to the, to the left. And um, there you can see also where the herbal garden or kitchen garden is situated, where apple orchard, and uh, then the large, large areas around the manor are part of the English style landscape park. And then on the right side, you can see the, the entrance to the area from the parking place. So visitors, when they come to the parking, parking place, they walk towards uh, the manor through so-called outer court park area, and then they enter the main court and then the house. So what do we know about uh, the history of the gardens in Lohisari? Well, we know at uh, that at least large manors always had a kitchen garden, and that has always been the case in Lohisari. In the garden, as you can see on this old map, uh, the garden was divided in square lots, a varied crop of herbs, vegetables and other useful plants, and fruit-bearing trees were grown. And uh, at Lohisari, even the cultivation of pear trees and exotic mul mulberries has, was attempted with rather poor results in that climate. But the map you see here, unfortunately not so good quality, but it's the earliest ma map where Lohisari's kitchen garden is shown, and it dates from 1797. And uh, the nowadays location of Herber Garden and Apple Orchard are shown with yellow squares. So one can say that they are approximately there where Lohisari had these activities in the 18th century. And the buildings are marked with red there. So from 1874, we have this beautiful garden plan um, made by Frederick Paludan and Morten Stenius. And in the handout, you have a beautiful, uh, good printed version of this. And, uh, the park was renovated in the 1870s and 1880s according to this plan. And the main part of the current park, park dates from this uh, period. And a uh, few, few weeks, weeks ago I was talking with our landscape architect and we were talking about the colorful trees, which are quite interesting spots of detail there. So they have had colorful trees in, in the garden. So, um, where was I? So, during this period, um, the owners, Mannerheims, also cultivated all kinds of plants, uh, for example, apple tree seedlings, and sold them to, to people. So, here's a modern guide illustration of the whole area. A part of the landscape park there on the top, on the top there, 
is kind of a more like a forest with a beautiful small hill with a nice view. Uh, the landscape park and apple orchard are taken by uh, care by a private company, so those have been out outsourced. So museum staff takes only care of the plants in wooden planters of the herbal garden. Uh, and also, if we want to add some new, new apple trees, we have to do it. Uh, our landscape architect is called Matthias Valberi. And the development and future direction are based on the landscape management plan of Lohisari that is updated regularly. There on the left, there's a, there's a photo of the cover of the management plan. So let's talk about the benefits uh, of the landscape park. Well, of course, when the park is taken good care of, it adds important and desirable layer to a museum. And many people come uh, to our place just to see the park. And uh, in, in our place, you don't have to pay entrance fee to get into the park. And it's open all year round, so it has benefits for local people as an open park. Ecolog ecological side is also very important to us. We try to do things as su sustainable as possible. We even had a dead fence for insects, and uh, we have also our own bees that make honey for our museum shop. It's a bestseller in our museum shop. And uh, of course, we also try to plant new trees so that there will be a continuation, so that future generations will also have old trees but of course, aesthetic side is also very important. But usually, if some place is taken very well care of, it eventually looks as aesthetically pleasing for people. So what kind of challenges we face during the year? Um, well, I have to say that overall, uh, museum is very satisfied, satisfied with a private company that takes care of the surroundings. And the uh, previous company was also very good. I think they have found a very good balance how to take care of the surroundings. But then there are dangerous trees. There are always dangerous trees for visitors and for structures. And we always try to keep one step ahead before a tree comes dangerous. But we do have accidents as we try to keep the old trees as long as possible. And uh, in the picture, there's one old tree that uh, fell a couple of years ago during the, the winter. But we always discuss together, museum, arborists, and the property owner. And uh, usually we have the same opinion after the discussion if some tree needs to be taken down. <laughs> one challenge is also that many visitors expect the surroundings to stay still. <laughs> Nothing can be changed, and uh, some people don't seem to understand that park is a living organism, always changing. And uh, here is a here's a photo of an inventory, unfortunately only in Finnish, of the Apple Orchard, made in year 2019. It was established in 2016, 2017. This inventory tells us that there were 17 old apple trees on site when we started. And um, uh, some, some trees are uh, probably from, uh, from the 60s, even older than that. But yeah, um, unfortunately, this is in, in Finnish, this inventory. Sorry? Yeah, you can recognize some of the, probably, yeah. <laughs> uh, the fruit-bearing trees are divided in three groups. Firstly, from around year 1870, when Mannerheim family was selling apple tree seedlings and even made a catalog to tell us now what trees they had in Lohisari. Uh, Count Karl Robert Mannerheim and Gardener announced in the local newspaper uh, in October 1870, the apple and pear varieties um, by, by the uh, Lohisari nursery, it was called. And uh, there were 
24 different foreign apple varieties and five foreign pear varieties on the sales list. Second group of trees are connected histo historically to the Marshall Mannerheim of Finland, Carl Gustav Mannerheim, uh, who was born in Lohisari, very famous pe person in Finland. And the third group are some known historical apple varieties in, in Finland. And uh, like I said earlier, when we started in 2016, there were 17 old apple trees. Then we have now during the years planted more, um, 41 trees have been on the list and all the trees are not planted yet. So altogether we have a spot for about 70, 76 trees. So what are the challenges with apple orchard? Pest animals, like here. There's a fence around the area, but still we some, do sometimes get accidents. Uh, second problem is the crop. It, it greatly va varies, varies uh, yearly. We have been planning to start to do or produce some kind of product for a museum shop, but we haven't come up with a with good idea yet. Uh, we let local people to come and, and pick the apples for themselves. And uh, deer are also very fond of the apples. <laughs> so we have to be very careful and not let uh, apples to pile up uh, under the apple trees to attract the deer. Uh, during the year, machinery has also done damages to the trees, especially when mowing the lawn. Some chosen trees um, have been very difficult to obtain, so we had had to start from the scratch and graft new apple trees for the orchard. And this seedling phase can sometimes be very slow and it takes many years until the plant has grown so that it can be put out to its uh, final spot. And then after all the trouble we go with the grafting new trees, then something happens and the tree dies during the season or winter. So that happens too. And growth is very slow. It takes years, the trees, to look good. And um, the third part of the gardens is the herbal garden or utility garden or kitchen garden, where we have 28 wooden planters and approximately 70 to 80 different varieties. Uh, we have only two museum gardeners working in the garden during the summer months. And uh, we call it Per Kalm's Museum Garden, and there's a, presumably a portrait of Per Kalm there on the, on the right side. So it was established in 2016, and um, this Finnish botanist Per Kalm was one of the most pop popular lecturers of his time. And in 1769, he gave a series of lectures uh, called about on the benefit of domestic plants uh, at the Turku Academy. And uh, three quarters of the students of that time at the Academy attended these lectures. Handwritten lecture notice of these lectures have been preserved. And that time lectures were given using dictation technology. Professor told one clip at the time and sometimes waited enough for everyone to write it down before the next section. And uh, we have two different authors' <coughs> notes uh, preserved from that lecture, and they are very similar. So you can say that uh, Per Kalm's ideas are clearly uh, present and presented in these, in these uh, lectures. So according to the teachings of Per Kalm, the garden design combined the ideal of the enlightenment. All plants should be useful plants, but the garden should also be symmetrical, well-organized, aesthetic. And all plants could be used as food or medicine. And uh, this herbal garden is designed by uh, museum gardener Aya Peura, who works at the Turku Museum Center nowadays as the Finland's first professional museum gardener expert. And uh, this garden has been a living laboratory 
of the ideas of the 18th century, and Aya Peura is doing her doctoral thesis on Perkalm and the results of this garden. Uh, so what are the benefits of the her herbal garden and apple orchard? Well, we have, uh, we have doubled the visitor amount from the year six 2016. Of course, uh, these, uh, these gardens are not the only factor, but one of the factors. And as we get lots of good feedback from public, uh, so nowadays the visitor amount is about 20,000 during the season. And to us, it's, a, it's a t like a temporary exhibition. Uh, it, it varies every year. And we have been getting lots of more followers on Facebook and Instagram since tw 2016. And uh, for a small museum, we have lots of followers. And especially beautiful garden pictures uh, are, are very popular. Of course, keeping up the herbal garden is quite expensive resources, like we spoke earlier. But of course, if we compare to 2016, our ticket sales have doubled. Our museum shop has almost tripled the sale. So the garden concept also works in the museum shop. And we have been also able to produce new events, like spring market, guided tours in the garden, and, and so on. So, um, and people come to see the garden many times during the year. But then we have the challenges. The gardeners are only hired for the season. There's a great employee turnover. And uh, almost every summer we have had a new person responsible for the garden. And even though a person has a knowledge, theological knowledge of gardening, they usually haven't had they usually have had to learn the methods of the 18th century gardening. And this garden expert, Aya Peura, has been helping in that in every, every season. We have 70 to 80 different varieties demanding different growing conditions. So that means that some people suffer, some plants suffer, some <laughs> thrive. So, and uh, it's funny that the garden word also makes people to expect to see a French formal garden often. So people have big expectation when they come to a garden. And uh, so some people don't understand it's a living organism garden is never ready. It doesn't look the same in every photo. And these 18th century theories behind the garden, they don't open easily for uh, visitors. I think we have to put more information on posters or something like that outside. And another page of challenges, pest animals, harsh winter conditions, and also the seedling phase very early in the spring. spring seed collection time in the autumn, otherwise we won't have the uh, garden next year. We even have problem with uh, watering. We got a new well a few years ago, but the water is not suitable for watering due to the high salinity. So we are bringing water with tanks to the garden now. There are no trees around to give shade uh, uh, to the garden, so the conditions are harsh for some plants. And these wooden planters outdoors, they have a quite short lifespan. And last, last I will show you uh, some photos of our museum shop that is greatly benefiting also from the gardens. The concept of the museum shop is garden life and manor life. And we have produced many items with our own brand, marmalade, kitchen towels, honey, bubbly lemonade, paper napkins, and, and so on. There are lots of items with floral and plant patterns. And we also see, sell the seeds collected from the garden. And uh, the clientele in uh, Ilohisar is mainly people that are better off. That's, that is one of the reasons why we're selling a lot of stuff at the museum shop. And we have the best income per visitor <laughs> of, the national, of the shops of the National Museum of Finland. And then the last slide, I wanted to remind you that the winter is coming. <laughs> Thank you, Baldias, for the opportunity to come and tell you about the work, what we do. And here's also my contact information if you need more information. 
uh, if you want to have the list of the plants or varieties we have in the garden, I can send that. That is only in in Finnish, but I I did that to Agnes. I sent it the list, and she could use Google Translate to translate it. Yes, thank you. <laughs>